Hi, so glad you could join me today. Welcome to this virtual presentation for SAMPI 2020. The topic I'm going to take you through today is a continuation of presentations given in previous conferences by my colleagues and is on the subject of compression molding of complex thermoset laminates. My name is Travis Adams and I'm a materials and process engineer for the Boeing company and I am the thermoset forming task lead for the rapid high performance molding of small parts program or the RAPM program for short. I was tasked as the lead for that particular tract with researching aerospace capable materials, and developing processes around those materials for the rapid manufacture of continuous fiber thermoset small parts. I am a part of the Next Generation Composites Group in St. Louis, Missouri, which is in the organization Boeing Research and Technology. I'm glad to be with you today, and I hope you enjoy this presentation. By way of introduction, there are four things I'd like to talk to you about today. The first is the industry trends and needs, or why this program is a program at all. The second is the compression molding of thermosets which is a solution to some of those industry trends and needs. We're going to talk about how compression molding works for thermosets and what that process entails. The third is the process development of complex laminates, or specifically about the challenge part that was part of the REPM program that we ran pathfinding studies using that compression molding process to develop. And fourth, we're going to talk about the results of that pathfinding activity and what does it mean going forward? As with most industries, the aerospace industry, and specifically for composite engineers like myself, were looked at to come up with technologies that could help us create more, faster, and better. Recently, there's been an interest in developing process, processes that enable the fabrication of high rate composite small parts in the order of thousands of parts per year. So these parts aren't just throwaway parts, we want them to be high performance aerospace grade parts, meaning that we want the mechanical and physical characteristics that we've become accustomed to for our secondary and primary structures. We want these small parts to be structural parts that can be used in critical applications. We also want these parts to be of high quality. We want a process that yields low porosity and stable physical characteristics that can be relied on to create a repeatable process. So we want a process that is robust enough that we can crank out thousands of parts per year and be confident in the quality of them coming out. We also want a process that's versatile. We don't want to be a one trick pony where we can only make flat laminates over and over again in a press we want to be able to make complex parts, parts of varying uh, textiles and varying materials to fit the needs of a particular platform. One solution to these trends and needs of the aerospace industry, specifically for small parts, is the compression molding of thermosets. This technology has been developed over the past couple of years under the RAPM program to great success. The way that this particular process works is you start with your prepreg and you cut and kit as you would a normal composite part. Where it starts to deviate is at ply collation. So in traditional hand layup slash autoclave or oven cured composites, you collate to a shaped mold and whenever you unbag, it comes out with that shape. For this particular process, it is ideal to collate flat and utilize the pressure of the press to form the part two shape. This helps reduce the amount of time it takes to lay up a part uh, and saves your hands as it can provide some benefit to safety if you have very highly complex small parts that you need to put down into uh, certain geometries as shown below as my example. The third step in the blank preparation is the pre-consolidation or no pre-consolidation stage, depending on what your needs are. We have found that pre-consolidation can make it easier for you to achieve uh, lower levels of porosity, whereas the no pre-consolidation step is a little bit faster 
um, and can increase or decrease your tech time. It has been shown that we can create high quality parts without a pre-consolidation, but for this particular program, uh, we did utilize it um, due to time constraints. The next step is to choose preheat or no preheat. Again, depending on the geometry and the needs of your particular part, you can choose to do this in uh, several ways or not do it. Um, a couple examples is using IR uh, heater banks and a shuttle frame to uh, preheat your, your charge to a certain temperature prior to insertion into your press. You can use an oven to preheat and then manually shuttle your charge into your press. Or you can choose to insert the charge into the press and close the press before it touches and let the part uh, preheat prior to closing the press to pressure. The next step is loading and closing the tool um, all together. You load the blank and close the tool. You can at then, that point close to a certain pressure or close to a certain gap, depending on what your needs are, for a predetermined amount of time. And then you would close to your final pressure for 30 minutes on an isothermal tool. And after 30 minutes, the tool will open up and you can remove your part and stage it for post-cure uh, in a batch or by itself. After that, you can continue with your typical final value added operations such as inspection and trim to where you would get your final product. So our process targets here is a 30 minute on tool cure time using an isothermal cure and we would like to yield high quality parts. For the RAPM program, it was important to continually demonstrate more complex geometries. One complex geometry that was designed specifically for this program is shown in the blue model above. It's a corrugated part of, uh, that has specific features that make it difficult to form from a flat blank. Specifically, it's 6.3 millimeters thick and it is uh, formed over a tight 12.7 millimeter radii. Um, this part is geometrically stiffened and utilizes um, a few different fiber and weaves. The resin system that we have chosen to go forward with here is the SICOM 5320-1 resin system, which has shown a flexibility for this isothermal 30-minute cure cycle and subsequent post-cure cycle. The fiber types uh, that we utilize are glass T650 fiber and IM7 fiber, and the corresponding weave as shown below. Outside of the compression molding tool itself, the press that was used or the clamping fixture that was used for this part was the surface generation performance the functional specification clamping fixture. It's got a max temperature of 824 degrees Fahrenheit or 440 degrees Celsius with an effective part area of 75 by 75 by 10 centimeters or 30 by 30 by 4 inches. And the max pressure on parts used was has been 650 psi. This clamping fixture is 150 tons and utilizes a pixelated tooling heating approach. Compression molding of thermosets gives you a lot of knobs to turn depending on what you need out of your part and what the geometry and material is you're using. For us, there were several things that we could choose to do. But for the sake of time, and the goal being not a design of experiments, but to get a good part as fast as possible, we limited these and used lessons learned from previous development efforts on Wrap'em going forward. We did a total of eight trials, and there were four things that we were looking at. The first one was cold forming. Cold forming is the act of putting the flat blank onto a cold tool to preform it in the shape prior to installation into a hot tool um, for final cure. The original intent of cold forming was to see if we'd get any wrinkles or tearing or anything in the part prior to installing it into a hot tool. Eventually, we thought that maybe this would provide some value in having it somewhat to shape prior to installation into a hot tool, but later realized that this was providing little value and it was actually more cumbersome and more time consuming than it was worth. This was abandoned around trial four. The second variable that we looked at was the use of a pre-consolidation. 
Preferably, pre-consolidation is not used, and you can vary other parameters in the pressing process to account for uh, getting lower porosity. But because of time constraints and wanting to build a good part as fast as possible, we decided to use this pre-consolidation phase to reduce the bulk and the porosity in the laminate prior to installation into the press to get the best quality laminate as possible. Trials 5 and 8 shown here utilize a pre-consolidation of 40 minutes and 116 degrees C. The third thing we looked at was preheat. We chose not to do preheat on any part except for the two that were pre-consolidated. The preheat used was 3 minutes at 179 C. What that accounts to is us not having an IR oven or a good way to, to shuttle a blank from an oven across the room over to our press while it was hot we ended up putting the charge onto the press and closing the platens together as close as possible without disturbing the charge and letting it heat up for three minutes prior to starting the cure program. Cure time and post-cure time were not varied throughout this process. We knew that these two things, as shown with the 30 minute cure time, would give us the mechanical and physical properties we desired out of this particular laminate. Other things to note was the use of damming material inside the mold. This was done in an effort to keep as much resin as possible in the laminate without bleeding. It was a small laminate and there's not a whole lot of extra, extra material to lose resin out of and we were struggling with porosity. The second thing was the use of release film on this laminate. This was done for a couple reasons. The first original reason was to try to get the, the part off the tool easier the part had a tendency to try to hug onto the tool and not release particularly easy. The second reason was adding extra material into the cavity can actually provide more pressure onto the part since the tool closes to a stop. What this does is pro uh, provides more hydrostatic pressure within the laminate so that porosity goes down. We will see in following sw slides why that was abandoned as well. At this point, it's important to stop and take a look at the actual molding tool that was used onto P on the PTFS clamping fixture. As shown on the previous slide, this is the mold that was used, although it's broken up so you can clearly see the bottom mold and the top mold. This particular tool was specifically designed for this surface generation machine using a pixelated tooling heating approach. You can see on the top right model the different pixels that would be on a tool like this. This helps you tailor the temperature of certain areas in the tool if you have a thicker or thinner laminate section. This tool is a closed cavity tool, which means that no resin was escaping out the side. We also had the ability to pull vacuum, apply thermocouples, and eject pneumatically or mechanically as needed. During the fabrication of these challenged parts, it was important for us to know what progress we were making from part to part to see if we were improving or getting worse. Two ways that we were doing that was checking the porosity levels and attenuation levels via ultrasonic C-scan, and the second way was checking the min and max thickness of each laminate. As you can see here, the, each one of these parts is significantly wider than the blue model you saw on a previous slide. The edges here were left on purpose because we knew that the ultrasonic C-scan machine we were using would only scan in a planar surface and those black spots that you see are the curves and would certainly show up, not leaving us a lot of areas where we could accurately scan and get a good feel for porosity. The two scans that were used were used for different reasons. The 5 megahertz scan was used for getting a, a feel for the level of attenuation, therefore porosity in the part. And the 1 megahertz scan was used um, as a sanity check to make sure that the curves were um, somewhat representative by the flat parts. So what you can see by looking at the ultrasonics is two very important things that, that pop out to you right away. Parts 5 and parts 8. All the other parts did not utilize the pre-consolidation process, and being in a hurry to build these parts as good as possible, as fast as possible, we chose to pre-consolidate. 
So you see in part five and eight, very low levels of porosity and pretty pristine looking panels, both in the five megahertz and the one megahertz range. But there's a reason why we went beyond trial five, which was a good part, and it wasn't because of repeatability. As you can see in the table to the right, part five was out of our desired thickness range. It was a little bit thin. If you recall from the previous slide, part five utilized a release film in the tool cavity to provide extra pressure on the laminate itself. While that did result in us getting a good quality laminate along with the pre-consolidation, we also found that we needed to get rid of it in order to get a good thickness part. We weren't off by much. So for trial number eight, we pre-consolidated the laminate press molded it, but press molded it directly on the match metal tool, which provided the thickness results that we were looking for. After our pathfinding activities, we wanted to pr prove that trials five and trials eight were not a fluke and carry that process through identically to find uh, how repeatable the process was. We built four more units as shown on the C-scans on the left. As you can see, each unit is indistinguishable from each other. So the, that showed us that the process was very, very repeatable, uh, and we were confident we could stamp out as many of these as we wanted and get the same results using that process. In addition to the C-scans and the thickness checks, it was also important for us to verify our physical characteristics, such as TG and degree of cure, in addition to our resin volume, fiber volume, and void volume. Utilizing the SICOMP 5320-1 resin system, the degree of cure and the TG are right around where we are hoping. So those ended up being very good. And from a porosity standpoint, we could see that the parts chosen for evaluation, T5 and T8, trial five and trial eight, that the void content in those parts was very low as well. We were happy with the results of these trials. The last bit of testing that we wanted to perform on these parts was on the way of photomicroscopy. Concern exists when we take a flat blank and form it over such tight radii that the unidirectional material inside the laminate would separate or get otherwise damaged. In addition, we were also looking for resin richness around the radii to see if that could be an undesirable condition that this kind of geometry lends itself to. As you can see in the photomicrographs, no such damage or resin richness exists. These photomicrographs were taken of a unit that was pre-consolidated and had used a process that was um, identical or similar to the process we carried forward with. Of particular interest is the image in the bottom left with the sidewall. The reason why that's of interest is because in this process, you have an issue where you only provide pressure in one direction, up and down. So the way that you consolidate plies that are um, perpendicular to your, your press platens is either one, having a good fitting tool, and or two, and two, um, having good hydrostatic pressure in the laminate itself. As you can see in that photomicrograph, we had both. We had both a good fitting tool and maintained excellent hydrostatic pressure in the laminate, which produced a laminate that was a very high quality and low porosity. The takeaway from this part manufacture was that all of the work that we had previously done on, on compression molding as part of the RAPM program is that this, this process works and it's repeatable and it can be used on various geometries. This part was a demonstration of complex curvature, a hybrid laminate, and proved that in a short amount of time and with few trials, we can go from uh, doing a very first part to repeating high quality parts over and over again. Finally, there are many people I'd like to thank. I'd like to thank the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, Dr. Jan Vandenbrand, for sponsoring this effort, and Army Research Office, Dr. David Stepp, for administrating the technical agreement. I'd also like to thank my Boeing co-authors, Timothy Lucchini, Jared Hughes, Stephen Shuchek, Adam Martinez, and Gail Hahn. 
and I look forward to the CMP virtual Q&A session for a direct contact with you. Thank you for watching this presentation and have a good day. Hello, I'm Scott Blake, founder and president of Aligned Vision, formerly Assembly Guidance. I'm sorry we weren't able to um, have this meeting together in Seattle. Thank you for taking the time to watch it on the web, and I hope that you and yours are and remain healthy. This presentation discusses innovative ways in which automatic inspection is advancing quality efforts in composites fabrication, ultimately leading to what's called quality 4.0, part of industry 4.0. My talk will cover these points. We'll discuss the limits of manual inspection, data avail availability for quality 4.0 with some examples, um, our automatic inspection technologies, current and future inspected attributes, and then quality approaches, digital point solutions, integration with manufacturing operations management, and manufacturing intelligence and closed loop manufacturing. Manual inspection is quite limited. One of its limitations is that it's incompatible with the digital thread. Um, stamps and initials aren't of much value when you're looking for traceability. There are also issues of production downtime, the amount of time it takes for a human to get to where they need and to look carefully at what they're seeking to verify. There are many safety risks. If you're using uh, machinery, it has to stop and be out of the way. And um, people are not very quantitative. Um, when they're looking at things, they're supposed to be meeting certain specifications, but meeting those specifications with real documentation is um, not very common. Manual inspection consumes an awful lot of cycle time on automated systems. And there are a lot of limitations to what people can do. Getting to where they need to be to do the inspection can be difficult. And for example, in AFP, sometimes the toes have to overlap and, or have gaps in order to meet the contours. And sometimes overlaps and gaps are flaws. So it's very difficult for inspectors to really check the features that the designer has asked for. Also, most of the time, the production is going to be correct. And this results in what's called uh, vigilance decrement. You get bored, it always looks the same. It's called expectation driven or expectation vision. And that can cause uh, human inspectors to miss flaws. Here's some data from a uh, Boeing study on um, uh, the time budgets for automatic uh, fiber placement. Uh, when they're making large um, structures such as fuselages or wings or nacelles, Inspection and repair consumes more than a third of the cycle time. And this is a very inefficient way to do things. If you have to stop adding value to do inspection, 
you are you're wasting a lot of value adding cycle time. An example I'm going to discuss here is automatic fiber placement with a large electro impact machine producing Boeing 777X components. They have two automatic inspection systems on this machine. One is a profilometer looking for laps and gaps that are not there by design. And the other is a large field system that inspects toe ends. And the profilometer would be on the AFP head in the center of this image. And then um, in the red circle are several of our laser vision systems that provide uh, an aimed vision image capturing system that runs asynchronously um, relative to the AFP head. And by running asynchronously, it means value can be added by the AFP head while the inspections are being done by our laser vision devices. When using the profilometer or the laser vision, large quantities of data are being generated in real time or very near real time. And these days, that data is just used to verify that the part has been produced correctly. Um, we're verifying features um, that the designers have called for, uh, overlap and gap conditions or the lacks or, or the absence of them and the correct location of the ends of the toes. But this data, if managed properly, can be used in the future um, in a closed loop quality function that we'll discuss a little bit later. Again, the profilometer is mounted on the deposition head and it does um, uh, near field distance measurement with parallax, and that creates a surface profile where the overlaps and gaps can, seen, can be seen. But these measurements are all relative to the other features within the um, uh, field that's where the data is being captured by the, by the profilometer. It just says these, these toes are too close to each other, they're overlapping or they're too far from each other doesn't say where the toes are within the um, entire part. And if problems are found with the profilometer, one of the things that our inspection can provide is pinpointing of the location of the potential flaw. Finding um, a millimeter or a fraction of a millimeter overlap or gap in a large part can be a very difficult process. Whereas when you're running automatic inspection, if a flaw is detected and the operator wants to go out and look at it, they can be guided right to the location of the area of interest by the integrated laser projector. So profilometers are used on uh, AFPs and automatic tape laying machines to uh, verify and document uh, overlaps and gaps. They're also used in filament winding, looking for pits, bulges, and distortions. Uh, and they can also be used on auto automated dry material placement machines. Our automatic inspection system is called laser vision, and it's a large field machine vision system. It's not metrology. Um, we're using data from the CAD model to aim a camera or to project reference lines that will be imaged by an aimed camera. 
and then we analyze the images. Laser vision uses a high resolution um, camera that's aimed to small regions in large parts. And so we're able to capture detailed images throughout a large field. Uh, the electro impact machines that are used on the Boeing 777X use three laser vision boxes so that they can look at all three sides of spars that are almost 100 feet long as they're being laid up. And we capture these high resolution images uh, with photogrammetric transforms that allow us to relate the pixels in the image to small regions on the surface of the CAD model. And then we analyze these images for desirable or undesirable features. And if we find something we don't like, we outline it with the laser projector. And in the two pictures on the right, the top one shows FOD, some poly material that has been uh, detected in a laser vision image. And the analysis algorithm that had detected the FOD has stopped the production and pinpointed the locations of the material. The bottom picture on the right shows the raw image that um, the, uh, of, of what was happening on the surface that an operator might have missed. It's often hard to see blue material on a, a black surface. And I want to point out that the operator does not look at these images. These images show what's happening internally on the laser vision system, uh, and they're archived in a traceable way. The operator can call up the images if they want to look at uh, what, what has um, uh, triggered the potential flaw in the analysis, and they can look at what's going on on the part everywhere except where the AFP head is. So material can continue to be put down while the potential flaw is examined by the operator. As I said, laser vision combines a laser projector with an aimed vision system. And the ghosted image on the right uh, shows the laser projector on the bottom. The green cylinder is the laser and the aiming system is at the right-hand end of the box. And the large blue cylinder is a 150 millimeter lens that captures high-res, high-magnification regions of the surface uh, with the capture region defined in the same way that the laser projector data is. Both use an optical aiming system driven by design data. And this enables detailed inspection across large and complex surfaces where the images are captured under data control and the images are automatically analyzed in near real time um, that enables immediate direct and actionable feedback. So we help you deal with flaws in process while at the same time automatically populating your digital twin, enabling full traceability. And this system can be a standalone system for hand layup or for um, uh, critical bonding prep, looking for FOD, or it can be integrated into a larger automated uh, manufacturing system. We have a software development kit that allows companies like Electro Impact uh, to have a, an application specific user interface so that the AFP controller in, the, in this case can use terms that are common to AFP to control the functions of both the imaging and the laser projection functions in laser guide. The bottom image on the right 
shows the kind of detail that we can capture with laser vision. These are half inch toes. The blue lines are the tolerance bands for the uh, ends of the toes. And the green lines are the, the found ends of the toes by our automatic image analysis algorithm. And these images would be captured, analyzed, and if everything was good, in a completely transparent way, they would just be added to the digital twin or traveler or work order documentation. Here are some examples of attributes we're currently inspecting for. We've been talking about the ends of the toes. And what I'm showing in the image on the left here is uh, digital calipers being applied to um, some AFP material. And this is an example of how quantitative we can be with our automatic inspection. Instead of a human inspector having to get up close and look at where projected laser lines are and saying, yeah, I guess that's within tolerance, um, we're able to do a true quantitative analysis of where the ends of these toes are or the edges of material are on the surface. I want to emphasize we're not doing metrology. We're not building a model of the surface. We're capturing a calibrated image where we assume that the surface is correct and we look for the location or characteristics of the features that are called out in the design and verify that they're present. It's more like using a gauge than a, um, a laser tracker. The middle image shows fiber orientation verification. The purple lines are the tolerance, which in this case is two degrees, and you can see how narrow that is. And the green line in the middle shows the found fiber orientation on this woven material. And once again, we have quantitative inspection and verification. I would challenge anybody to reliably tell me whether something was in or out of uh, a, a two degree angular tolerance on a curved surface. Uh, this, this really does that. And then on the right, again, is uh, the pinpointing of FOD that's been found. And this would have stopped any process that was using laser vision automatically. And um, after the operator removed the FOD, it could be reinspected, and we would expect the analysis of the images uh, to confirm that there was no longer any, any FOD present. If the operator were to override the, um, um, the notification that there was a flaw that was present, that would also be documented in the lab report, which is part of the uh, digital twin. And if FOD were found later, we would know exactly where it was actively ignored. Other attributes that we've worked on, we're not running in production at the moment, uh, include wrinkles, bridging, and shear. We will have a shear analysis in um, a production release shortly. And if you look at the image on the left, uh, we're doing very much what a profilometer would do, but optically in a very large field. The white dots in the picture are um, laser references that have been projected somewhat tangently to the surface. The green dots are where we would expect them to be if the surface were the correct sh shape, which in this case is flat. And by measuring the distance between the um, expected dots and the found dots uh, in the image, we can calculate how big the surface distortion is and detect wrinkles. So we project rows of references, capture images, and analyze 
how far the projected references were from where we expected them to be. And with a simple analysis that uses the transform that we have with our picture, we can calculate how much the surface is out of tolerance. And that, that same process can be used in what we're showing in the middle picture, which is to detect bridging. And bridging occurs when material is, is pulled up from the surface that it is supposed to be um, uh, fully in contact with. And this often occurs as you put a piece of material down on a complex part, as you work the material into um, one portion of the surface, you might actually be pulling it out of another portion of the surface. And it's very, very hard for a person to see this. You know, it's a complex surface either way. But by using this kind of automatic inspection, we can quantitatively determine how out of tolerance the surface is. And once again, if the material were draped properly, we would expect the laser dots to um, appear where the green dots are. The um, red dots are where we have calculated the um, uh, location of the laser dots, and um, we've colored them red because they are out of tolerance in this image. The right-hand image shows fiber orientation measurement, which is what the horizontal line is showing there, but we're also showing a line in the other axis, and this represents the measured amount of shear um, between the two axes in the woven material. So it's possible to get the material down correctly with the dominant uh, fiber orientation in the correct place, but to have distorted the material such that the other axis of the woven is uh, not what the designer had called for. We can also apply laser vision beyond basic uh, composites fabrication. One of the things that we can look at are raw materials, which um, in many cases are only inspected manually, perhaps by the layup operator. And being sure that there are no flaws in the raw materials is critical to part performance. We've done a lot of work with um, checking for peel ply FOD in critical bonding. And we can also look at characteristics from machining and assembly. That's what we're showing in these three pictures. The bottom picture on the left uh, is um, a raw image of um, some rivets, that have been placed uh, in some composite material on a, um, uh, a wing box structure. You can also see the presence or absence of um, peel ply. The, um, uh, the, the ribs in the left portion of the picture have some peel ply on them and the other ribs do not. The pictures are high res and if you look at the center picture, which has shows us zooming in some, we can see that there's a real difference in the, in the fasteners that we've put uh, in that part. Uh, some are titanium and some are aluminum. And the picture on the right shows how much zooming in we can do with these high resolution pictures. Um, all the pixels in these images are calibrated, so we know how big they are, and we can tell if those rivets have been translated um, where they are, and we can almost read the numbers right now. These, I think, were taken from 15 feet away, and these rivets are about a quarter of an inch across. So these are examples of inspection beyond um, basic composites fabrication.
So initially, we're operating a digital point solution. We import the design and control data from manufacturing operations management, and we conduct in-process inspection. And then we can export the as-built data to the manufacturing operations management system. And this is enabled with our SDK. We've been using a lot of artificial intelligence to develop the image analysis algorithms. And this has proven to be very efficient. Um, and we're combining uh, deep learning classifiers with thresholding programs that enable us to see things that would be difficult to see with traditional machine vision algorithms. And what we're showing here is a, a raw image of some FOD on the left. Um, classifiers that have uh, identified an anomaly and then running a thresholding problem analyzing the image that makes it very clear where the FOD is, even though they're very different kinds of FOD in the same image. And just going into a little bit more detail, uh, we've looked at all kinds of things uh, with these um, classifiers and other analysis algorithms, and we can see loose composite material, pieces of gloves, liners, cutters, um, even uh, you know pieces of a blade. And what this is enabling is an integrated quality approach, where we're generating data for the quality management system. Uh, as well as being fully integrated into the manufacturing operations management system. And this allows us to look at a full spectrum of materials, processes, and component attributes. And the, the graphic on the bottom on the right shows um, how our SDK enables the control of the system as well as the image analysis. And the image analysis can be done uh, by a third party, as is shown in this graphic. So the digital twin is a virtual representation of each component as built. And we're able to even combine adjacent images into one very large image, the image on the left is actually made of nine different images that have been connected. And you can zoom in and very clearly look at the characteristics there. And this raw data is the basis for manufacturing intelligence, that by analyzing these images for different characteristics, we can learn a lot about what's happening not only in our parts, but in our design and manufacturing processes. And that is what's leading us to quality 4.0, fully closed loop manufacturing. People do design and simulation, and then they send that out for manufacturing and things get inspected, and then the inspection data gets accumulated in the digital twin. But this documentation and data that's held for all these parts is the database that drives a deep learning system. And the deep learning system can be developed to look at design and simulation, that can look at processes, that can find correlations between design characteristics and, and flaw development. And that type of analysis enables the prediction and prevention of flaws at earlier stages in the product life cycle. That's the material that I've prepared for this presentation. I appreciate your making it to the end with me. And if you have any thoughts, any questions or contacts, 
uh, questions or comments, you're welcome to contact me at uh, Aligned Vision. Here's my email. We'd be happy to discuss any applications that you would have for automatic inspection and deep learning applications. Thank you. Hello from Germany, hello from Hamburg. Um, Simon and me, we want to present our research work about tendering epoxy foams uh, with an innovative process approach using copper mates as a blowing, blowing agent. Now, the last time also, this was a bit, takes time, next slide. Yeah, here it is. Okay, Simon, write to me. You will see him later. He's the head of our department for material development. And me, I'm the founder and the CEO of Compress Tech. I did start the, with the startup several years ago. Five years later, we had a very successful exit. I did start a new business. And now Compress Tech is a specialist for research and development for polymers and composite innovations in the field of composites um, and hold of multiple patents. I'm quite active in different academic and public business associations of course in of course also in SEMPI and uh, so I'm quite open for new innovative processes made by polymers and composites. Why composites? Because it's light and light means we have got a very good resource efficiency and this is used in the automotive industry, in the marine industry, and also sports equipment, and of course also in aircraft. Here we are dealing with aircraft interiors. You see in the background some uh, parts we are also developing for the aircraft business, and on the right side, a catering trolley. And uh, catering trolleys consist of sandwich structures, and uh, this sandwich structure also needs a certain uh, fire requirement means FSD fire smoke toxicity. Why sandwich SMC? SMC itself is a very nice inspired material. It's cheap, uh, depends what is cheap, but it's also easy to process. And the sandwich SMC process is also shown here. The left, you have got uh, yellow, the foam. Then you have got in blue your SMC. Here, visualize a charge of 100% could be also lower. Second step, it's a preforming step. Then you put this stack in a hot mold, in a hot dip edge mold, temperature about 150 degree. Sorry, on there. You press it, and you see that the SMC is flowing in the cavity, in the uh, empty cavity. And here in the molding, you have got your ready part. It's not only a flat panel, you can also have got a very, a very different geometries. This is done in huge presses. So we also need about uh, inner pressure about 30, 40, 40 bars for glass SMC. If you work with CSMC, carbon SMC, you need some more inner pressure. Um, so what are the requirements for our foam we want to develop? Uh, of course, this is high temperatures, uh, resistance, so about 155 degrees Celsius and also a certain uh, pressure uh, resistance, about 30 bars, and this FST uh, characteristics. This uh, could be fulfilled with an epoxy because it's got good properties and a high TG, and also with modified with optimized flame retardants. So if your laptop in the cabin gets fire, not the whole cabin will burn. Um, we have got different mechanisms for flame retardancies. Uh, the first is uh, radical scavengers. So this uh, principle is acting in the gas phase. Um, in the pyrolysis, products need to be volatile. And this is a combustion of carbon monoxide. Most of the agents which are used here are 
on the basis of phosphorus. Uh, one example is uh, dopo. Here, yeah, the real name of this dopo we're using. I don't want to read it out because, of course, I will make a mistake. Second the mechanism is cooling the polymer by agents which do um, give water as a byproduct. They do act in a solid phase. They also use uh, an anothermic reaction, so also they keep, they take energy. And uh, an example is mineral hydroxide, for instance, we use ATH as its means. And third, duration of a protective layer, also done as an example by mineral hydroxide. Um, they do may perform dense gases, which do lay on the surface and they create a layer uh, of a ceramic layer or a char layer. For many epoxies, um, yeah, you can use hollow particles, hollow particles like polymer uh, particles, glass particles. Disadvantage is uh, this leads to high viscosity and this is not good for uh, or process later. And these particles do not um, blow, that do not foam anymore, mostly, so uh, the density is limited. You can also use blowing agents for foaming, physical or chemical. Both have got the disadvantage that some products or also byproducts um, are not good for health, so they are banned by reach. And also with physical foaming agents, the kinetics of epoxies are quite complicated. So we did choose a new approach. We want to use cover mates. What's a cover mate? A cover mate is, uh, these are the esters and the salts of the carbamatic acids. So these are produced by bubbling carbon dioxide in amines and it gets a solid, it's a powder. Uh, this is not new, this also was used in the 60s. At, in the 60s they used this um, process for uh, improving adhesives and glues. And we want now, we want to use it for making foams. What do we need? We need a means with a certain medium high basicity, with a high molecular stiffness. And uh, yeah, one could use, but we don't, use APs, DDCMs and XDAs, but those means have got only a poor, uh, uh, reaction control and also a low TG. So before I will say which means we do need, we use uh, a schematic process of our forming process. So first here you blow carbon dioxide in the means, uh, it does block and you get this salt, this powder. This powder you add in a dispenser, adding particles, additive, Fire, uh, require, uh, fire um, um, parts for <laughs> against fires. Epoxy resins, you mix it, then you make an injection process in a closed mold. The reaction is then fulfilled and you make a demolding and you get the epoxy foam. What we want to get, we want to get a fine homogeneous closed cell morphology. And the key parameters for this are of course, the recipe of hardened resin. Also, uh, the viscosity control by using pre-curing. Um, so we can also mix blocked and unblocked hardness. Uh, we have got the um, possibility to use certain nucleates and also the way by forming. So we can foam open in a closed, in a closed mold, also have a uh, free forming in an open mold. And now I want to hand over to Simon, who will go more in detail. Thank you. My name is uh, Simon Kaiser, Head of Material Development and Compress Tech, and I want to present to you the experimental results of our study. First of all, what kind of material we've used. We've used two epoxy resins, DGBA and one epoxy Novolac, supplied by Olding and one m curing agent as well for the pre as for the carbon mid salt. It, it is isoforone diamond IPDA, supplied by Huntsman. For the flame retards, we've used two different approaches as being said. First of all, ATH in two different particle sizes and as well DOPO. 
as an alternative flavor tart. The carbamate synthesis, as being said, you will bubble CO2 into an ethanol amine solution at a constant rate, for example, 200 milliliters per minute for a few hours while constantly stirring. After the reaction and sedimentation, the product is then filtered and washed with ethanol and then afterwards dried into a white powder, the carbamate salt, or as we call it in the study, blocked IPDA, BIPDA in short. This BIPDA being said is then dispersed with resin, additives, and so on. In our case, in a three room process to get a very, very homogeneous dispersion and particle distribution. And afterwards, uh, it's formed in closed molds in batch forming or injection forming processes in an oven or in hot press at elevated temperatures to get our epoxy forms. For the experimental evaluation of our epoxy forms, we used several methods. For the reactivity measurement of our system, we've used DSC, the decomposition behavior of the TGA. Uh, the decomposition behavior is uh, evaluated using TGA, the viscosity profile using a rheometer test, and the glass transition temperature using DMA. The morphology uh, we've evaluated with SEM, and for the mechanical test, we've chosen compression tests referring to DIN and ISO 844. The so flammability is tested with UL94 horizontal burn tests, and for SFST properties, we've chosen a concalorimeter test. First of all, the decomposition behavior of the PIPDA. Why is this important? The carbamate salt functions in our formulation as a latent blowing agent. So we need to know at which temperatures the decomposition happens when the unblocking uh, reaction happens. So where, where is the point where we get from the carbamate salt, the amine curing agent with its active and the CO2? And what kind of handling and process temperatures we have to fulfill in our, in our form. On the left hand side, you can see TGA curves from IPDA and blocked IPDA. And on the right hand side, you can see the DSC curves of blocked IPDA. And as you can see, we have a decomposition onset at around 80 degrees Celsius. So this is the maximum temperature we can uh, tolerate in handling and storage of our product. We have a peak decomposition at around 148 degrees Celsius and a complete decomposition at 166 degrees Celsius for this specific system. So we need process processing temperatures of above 160 degrees in order to get a full curing and forming. On the right hand side, you can see the reactivity measurements using DSC of an epoxy Novolac IPDA and an epoxy Novolac BIPDA, so blocked IPDA system. And as you can see, the reaction peak shifts from lower to a higher temperature when using BIPDA instead of IPDA. And this is, of course, uh, due to the decomposition behavior of the BIPDA. So it's slightly shifted to higher temperatures also in the DGEBA system. So we need quite high temperatures for our forming and curing in comparison to the unformed system. But that's okay because uh, of the endothermic decomposition of the carbonate. So this draws energy from the curing reaction and prevents the system from overheating or burning. As being said, the viscosity of our system is the key parameter in order to tailor our form morphology. For a homogeneous morphology, we need a high viscosity at the point of forming to get a small cell size and small cell size distribution as well. And Remember, this is not at room temperature. We need a high viscosity at elevated temperatures at forming, uh, at forming temperatures. Here you can see on the left hand side the rheology curves of neat epoxy novolac resin, epoxy novolac with a stoichiometric ratio of IPDA, and epoxy novolac with 30% of the stoichiometric ratio. And as you can see, the IPDA causes the system to cure at quite low temperatures, much lower than the decomposition, uh, peak decomposition of our form, so we don't get a good forming process here. But if you are adding only 30% of IPDA, we get a significant increase 
in viscosity at elevated temperatures without a full curing. This translated to an epoxy noble like PIPDA system shows that when we are using 30% of blocked, 30% uh, of unblocked IPDA together with a 70% blocked IPDA, this also increases significantly our system's viscosity at elevated temperatures, which allows for a more homogeneous morphology. Here you can see the same measurement with a DGBA instead of epoxy nubulac. And for example, when you take this form without pre curing, the neat form, you get a very rough form morphology with a big cell size diameter, an average of 166 microns. When you're using this pre curing approach, we just showed, the morphology gets very homogeneous and uh, we get a much lower average cell size diameter of around. 54 microns. If we even more want to influence our form morphology, we can add nucleated particles, for example, in this case, 48% of ATH. And this even more reduces our average cell size diameter to 42 microns. So, as you can see, we have, besides the density control, of course, two tools for the tailoring of our epoxy form morphology, and this is the pre curing approach, as well as the nucleating particle. For the mechanical properties, we are showing here a summary of some of our results. For more detail, please have a look at the um, conference proceedings paper. Here, for example, on the left hand side, you can see the comparison of two epoxy Novolac BIPDA forms with two DGBA. IPDA forms, the IPDA forms, with two different densities, 0.3 and 0.5 grams per cubic centimeter. And as you can see, the higher density of the form leads to higher compressive strength, of course, which can be expected. And you can also see that the epoxy novolac forms seem to outperform the DGEBA forms in the mechanical behavior. And this is besides other effects caused by the intrinsic higher viscosity of the epoxy novolac and the slightly better morphology of these forms. Here you can see the TGEBA based forms with three different densities, 200, 300, and 500. And for the 500, also the pre cured version marked with a P. And as you can see, the pre curing not only leads to a finer morphology, but it also leads to a higher initial compressive strength of our system. And last but not least, We've evaluated the influence of our filler particles, our flame retardant ATH particles, and it can be seen that with increasing ATH content, also our compressive performance increases significantly. Talking about thermal performance of our epoxy form. Remember the process temperature window for the pressing of sandwich SMC is around 135 to 155 degrees Celsius. So this is a type of temperature range we're talking about here. And all of our NEAT and ATH modified foams succeed at this temperature with a higher TG higher than 155 degrees Celsius. Only when using DOPO, the TG is compromised, but you can compensate it when you're using only a small amount of DOPO, as we have done here, in combination with the ATH. But how does the system perform in flammability tests? Here you can see the results of our UM94 horizontal burn test. And it can be concluded that all of our flame retardant, uh, modified, flame retardant modified foams succeed these tests. Only the NEAT system without any flame retardant failed because of dripping. In this diagram, you can see the average flame of time of the ATH particle filled epoxy novolac foams as well as the dopo modified foams and you can quickly see that with increasing filler content 30 40 and 50 percent you get a very low flame of time and a very low flammability also the dopo modified system as well as even better the dopo and ath filled system perform quite good in these pictures here you can see on the left side the outer surface of the flamed the burned specimen and on the right side the cross-cut section 
of the ATH boxenovolac foams. And as you can see, the protective layer of the ATH not only works in a compact formulation, but also here in our closed cell epoxy form. For the FFT properties, of course, we're aiming for a high time to ignition, a low heat release, and a low smoke release. We've compared our pre cleared epoxy novolac system, epoxy novolac foam system, with an ATH modified version, a dopo modified version, and a version where we used a little of dopo and a small amount of ATH. And as you can see, overall, this combination of dopo and ATH shows significant synergy effects, and we have the best results here of our system. Now I will hand over back to Christian for our final conclusion and outcome. Yeah, Simon, thanks a lot. I think um, Simon has very well shown that we were able to uh, develop a very high performance flame retardant foam with a nice uh, compressive strength with a sufficient TG for using it in the SNC foam process. Of course, by the idea of using Covermates, we've got a very env environmentally friendly foam in comparison to uh, state of the art uh, uh, chemical blowing agents. And it's also easy to handle because it's a one pack formulation. So, in logistics, you do not need the cooling. What we do in the next steps, of course, optimization of the process. Um, we want to use uh, synergetic effects of fire retardances for optimizing also this property. We want to reduce the density to get also a more, it's already light, but also more light foam. Uh, we want to reduce uh, pre-curing times by using a multi-mean system. And uh, finally, this leads to an industrialization of the process to step from the lab scale to an industrial scale, scale to also to produce a bigger and uh, larger SMC uh, parts. With this slide, I want to thank you. Thank you for listening. And I also want to thank you. Thanks. Volker Eichstedt and uh, Christian Beke from the University of Bayreuth for the co-authorship. And the left also thanks a lot for funding this project by the German government, by the Swiss government, in the Eurostars project by the European community. And finally, again, thanks to University of Bayreuth and thanks to Meister Brace of this cooperation. Thanks a lot. Bye. On behalf of Sampi North America, thank you for watching and congratulations again to our 2020 Outstanding Technical Paper winners.